Uh, good morning, folks. Morning, Steve. Some new faces. Wow. Did everybody get a new style for 2021 or we just get the word out? Well, there was this <laughs> hack <laughs> that uh, happened. <laughs> turns out people are a little interested in that, huh? We'll give folks a few minutes to get on. Uh, give me a second. All right, um, I posted, I'll post the relink of it. Uh, when I tried to post the agenda from my phone yesterday, I wasn't able to get that posted. So I added it this morning. So here's the hack doc. If folks want to sign in. Welcome Niaz to 2021. Hey Steve. What are you doing? There's Marina. All right, so in, oh, actually I didn't post it there. Let me uh, grab the, the, so is anybody else having trouble with Slack on the Notary channel? Yeah, Slack is down. Yeah, there's a big Slack outage. Okay, all right, so it's just me. Um, if anybody's got, and well, how can I get that in there? If anybody's got the link that we had, I put in the notary chat, but it's from Twitter that we can, if we can just post that for others if they wanted to read, or I can get that into the notes afterwards. I think I, the, 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 um, the, the one UK, from the yeah, stock of. Yeah, I, I have actually got, uh, um, Think um, I'm just opening the other ones as well. I think it's yeah. I think it's this one. Um, basically, so yeah. There's lots of news, and of course, the press kind of picked up on the whole Russian angle of it. And for those of us here, we probably don't care who did it. It's just the how did it get done, and what can we do to. Uh, prevent it to, uh, one of the things I thought was interesting was that how quickly they figured out that it was actually in the build system. Um, so sometimes it's not just preventing it, it's being having some traceability about it also. So that I thought was pretty interesting. Um, okay, so we'll get that link posted. And if anybody else has any more links on more deeper uh, info around what was actually done, um that's always helpful uh the the summary of from what i read from this article and a couple other articles that came out in december when it first occurred um was the build system was hacked um it was later re reported that there was actually no source code the source code that was being built per se was not hacked um and the distribution system was not uh exploited. In fact, it was the distribution system. Well, I guess the distribution was exploited. They shipped updates to the existing package that came out of the, the build system. So it was a, a valid build um, and were shipped as updates. Uh, so we often get concerned around making sure updates are current. Uh, in fact, we have this conversation a lot around containers of you always want to grab the latest container, latest or newest, whatever the, the tag might be. Um, and every time you do a build, you're always pulling public packages. But in this case, uh, the, the, the fact that they were keeping current turned out to be the problem. Um, so I thought that was kind of interesting. The, uh, what I also read early on, and I need to go back and find the articles, and they're actually in Twitter, because that's where I first got a note of it, um, that it was, uh, the packages were signed by SolarWinds and they were because of that, they were actually able to very quickly trace it back to that it was the build system that produced valid builds 
And that's as far as it was. I, I also read something, and I, I have to go double check this, that it was .NET code, um, which the only thing there has kind of helped me brainstorm a little bit in my own head, and I have to reach out to a couple more folks that are just coming back from vacation of the various ways that um, if it wasn't source code, and now I'm in total hyperbole here, totally hypothesizing, if it was packages that got pulled in, that how could a package either get pulled in that was had the exploit or the package list that is part of the build system been changed, uh, I forget what .NET calls it, but there's basically a package YAML of some sort or JSON file. .NET has this injection model, that declarative injection, just by having something declared, it, could, it will automatically start running code. So those are, those are totally my guesses. So I'm just trying to brainstorm out some ideas. And the idea is, one, how could we mitigate from an exploit of this type as much as we know? Um, and is there anything we need, anything we need to adapt on the plans that we've had thus far? So I think that was my link, little two cents. I'll let others. I, I think that link might have been the one that was the one that analyzed the .NET code. I just posted it. Yeah. So I put together a quick um, presentation about kind of Tuffin and Toto and how they relate to this attack. Um, I think as we learn more about the attack, I think it's definitely a little bit more on the Intoto side than the tough side because of where in the process it fell. But I can go ahead and present that and talk about that if people are interested. Um, yeah. Before we get into a presentation, just because we have a bunch of new folks here, um, has anybody else got any thoughts or comments? Um, I do have a question. Um, do you have a link where it shows that the uh, code repository itself wasn't compromised? I think based on the articles I've read um, so far, it wasn't clear whether this was uh, an issue with the code repository itself being compromised or whether the build system also was compromised, uh, just the build system so, alone. So, so yeah, I mean, I, to, it seems the SEC filing from SolarWinds says the the source co the source code was says that the malicious code was not in the source code repository. Okay. Um, and so, um, um, or at least isn't. I mean, isn't now. I, I I don't know on what. I mean, I think that it's still somewhat conjectural because, like, it could have been in the potentially in the source code repository for a while or, or, and then deleted but that seems but maybe that's unlikely i don't know i mean it's it, the some of the analysis suggested that the code was written so that if people looked at it it looked reasonable which made me think that either they're expecting it to be the code to be kind of reverse engineered or in maybe in testing or they were were expecting people to see the source code for it so I think it's a little bit unclear at this point. The um, stuff that I read was two things. One, the, the, this article that the, so, the SEC filed, the first one that Justin posted, specifically talked about the source code wasn't uh, exploited. But what's interesting is what we all know with build systems is there's lots of things that are pulled in to run the build system. So I don't know if a script was hacked or what. So the source code that compiles the code was declared as not being violated. The other things that I heard was what the news was reporting as a very well-intended hack or smart and all the various references was the early article I read, and I'll double check the one that, uh, that Justin put there, talked about it would stay dormant for like two weeks so that you could not monitor malicious activity. Like if you write a scan on the code right away, um, it didn't show anything for normal patterns. It was only after a period of two weeks that it would start um, uh, looking at, at bits on the machine is what, what is the way it was described. So it wasn't like social security numbers. It was like, what other information could have access to that? It, and I bet I have to find the, the articles that went back and referenced that specifically. So what's interesting is if the source code wasn't hacked, what in the build system was hacked? Was there a lot of bits that were laid on there? Was it the scripts that run the build were hacked? Those are the things I haven't seen in more detail yet. But those are, that's a great question because that is the thing that I've been working you know, We've talked about ephemeral clients for build systems as well. Anybody else? Brandon, you were kind of active on these threads while I was, a bunch of us were trying to take vacation. 
Yeah, that's why I jumped in and joined in on this call, but um, nothing for me to add. I was just wanted to be here in case any comments came up. All right, for nobody else, Marina, it's all yours. Okay, um, let me see if I can get screen sharing working. All right, can people see that? Yep. All right. Um, so yeah, these first couple of slides kind of go through what we've already talked about, like, you know, what was the solar winds attack? Um, and I think I'll go through like this, because I think when I present it messes up the screen sharing. But um, so, um, yeah, so there's a compromised release of, solar, of the solar wind software. And um, what they're currently saying it was somewhere in the build process, something, something between when the source code was written and when they actually made the release. And because it was the build process, there was a valid signature on the software, but that it was because like the build system was compromised, whatever came out of the build system was, was signed, even though it was malicious. And so um, it's definitely one thing to look at and maybe how we can prevent malicious things from being signed by the system. Um, and once installed, the compromise allowed the attackers to generate um, sign-on tokens, um, gain access to systems, and generally cause a lot of trouble once it got on the systems. But for now, let's focus on kind of that first part of how they got on to the systems. So the kind of like we've been talking about, this was a supply chain vulnerability um, in the build system. And it was not detected either by the signing entity or the customers. So nothing after the build system had any way to detect that something funny had happened during the build system process. And so that's kind of what the what we need to do to kind of prevent an attack like this would be to give somebody visibility into what's happening in this process. Just for clarity, because I'm nervous about anything we talk about here getting exploited as, as this was definitive. We should be careful. Like we, there's, I haven't seen any information that it was Jenkins or Docker that was part of this. So. Oh, yes, this is an, um, yes, you're, you're definitely correct. This <laughs> is an, uh, the image is um, il illustrative, not like, yeah. yeah. So um, yeah, don't take that. Well, I'm a recording of this. I just want to, maybe yeah. if you share this slide, you might want to put something on conjecture or something. Like for example, or whatever. Yeah, it's an example. An example this is thing. good. This is what we, we're doing is focusing on the container stuff. Yeah. Um, but we don't know what, it, I don't think anybody knows any more facts on this. Yeah. And this is how, wow. we, can, how we can project Wait. these systems, not necessarily um, their systems. Yeah. So that's kind yeah. of the focus here. I mean, I um, think we know it was mostly, it was almost all Windows software. Yeah. So and not containerized. So th not these, not these. Things. Yeah, actually, it's specifically not them. But these are the ones we'll probably talk about. You know how we can make them better. Um, so then I'll, I'll talk a little bit about Intoto and about Tough. So Intoto um, protects the build process from code packaging. So it kind of the whole process between when the you know when the code is written by developers to when it's actually sent out, and then it kind of moves on to Tough, which I'll go over in a second. Um, so the, the way this works is that in each stage of this process, um, and this is an, another example, again, not necessarily what they did in this particular case, is that you know you have the right step, packaging, and then inspection. And then, um, so in each of these stages, you can add in total metadata that says, okay, this is what came in at my stage, and I'm going to sign that that's what I got. And then the next person says, yes, I got you know what you signed, this is what I produced, I'll sign that step as well and kind of attest cryptographically that each step was actually followed and the correct person or entity followed each correct step in this process. Um, and then I think some of you might be more familiar with, with Tough, but I'll, I'll go over this as well. So Tough protects the release process from after software is packaged to when it is installed. And in some ways, this is a little bit different because the, um, the actual bits don't change between packaging and installation, which makes this a little bit more, I wouldn't necessarily say easier, but a little, little more straightforward because you wanna make sure that the user downloads the exact same bits that were packaged. And that's kind of the whole goal of Tough. So um, yeah, so once it's packaged, the developer or whatever packaging entity can attach um, signed metadata to this image. Um, there's a lot of other steps to Tough, but essentially the signed metadata ends up on the client side 
and then is verified and the client can make sure that the, the metadata matches um, the package that was installed. Um, so combining Caffeine and Toto, this is kind of the meat of, of what I want to propose is that um, you can use Tough to also contain this in Toto chain, which then connects it kind of end to end from the first time someone's writing code to when the package is installed on the client system. And you can verify that entire chain of the supply chain using the combination of these two technologies. So um, in a sense, kind of the, what's said here, the TUF is the transport protocol for the Intoto, Intoto attestations. And there's a way in TUF targets metadata to include the Intoto metadata in that location so that you can kind of attest all the way down. And then both the client can, can verify that entire end-to-end -end process and anyone um, who's uploading this to a repository can also check that ahead of time for the clients. So, um, so for example, in the, the SolarWinds case, which again, we don't know too much about, but the person who is in charge of attaching that SolarWinds signature could have verified the process ahead of time before actually attaching the signature that then clients use to verify the software. So um, it could kind of be stopped at two different points, both by not attaching the signature and by the clients being able to check um, can you explain it a little more? Because I, if we assume that, based on the knowledge we have, that the build was valid, and the from the time the, the components were built and shipped to the various clients, they were also validated. What is it that Tuffer and Toto would have stopped it dead in the tracks? How would that have done? Yeah, so that's actually that's the exact question here. So. Um, Again, yeah, it was definitely something in the build system that was compromised. That's, I think, as much detail as we know right now. Um, so in this, this layout, the attackers would have to either compromise the signing keys for the build process, which I think for now we'll assume they wouldn't do. And then, um, which of course requires some, some work, but, um, and the other thing, or the other thing they could do is um, they would have to make sure that there's no mismatch between the metadata that is signed. Um, I think in practice, something like reproducible builds and independent rebuilders um, really guarantee that um, this mismatch would be detected because um, the artifacts would be different. So um, the way in, in most build systems, one of the reasons they're hard to secure and guarantee is that um, the artifact is different every time it's built. As a very easy example, like the, the time that it's built is often included in it. And so if you compare something that was built twice right next to each other, even on the same system, the, the binaries often don't match. And reproducible builds works to create a version that doesn't have differences between these binaries so that you can detect um, a malicious build. Um, and I think that's the strongest protection that you can, you can have in this system is you can have you know, a sign from, okay, this is what it was before it was built, this is what it was after it's built, and it's, it should be that every single time. I think, Short of that, if you are not able to do fully reproducible builds, what the Intoto metadata is able to do is say that, you know, this computer or this person built the software, um, which depending on what kind of build system compromise might have been able to detect the system anyway. If like, you know, some third party computer had done the malicious build and then just given it back to the rest of the supply chain, that would be detected, for example. But um, if they actually were compromised the server that contained the keys used for the build, I think that you would need something stronger like reproducible builds. And I think someone- Can you talk a bit about like, so the way I think of a reproducible builds, and, and I'm not, I'm asking, the, I'm stating it with a question. Yeah. Reproducible builds are awesome for open source projects that, you know, it's built by some, the open source project initiative or whatever, and I'm, I'm not trying to pick on any cloud. We pull Kubernetes images from GCR, let's just say. Um, but we've also been concerned, for instance, in Azure and other places in this well. Um, so we actually don't pull the images from GCR. We actually rebuild them ourselves and gives us a chance to patch. So in that case, the reproducible builds would catch it because if uh, we could also meet, in this case, we could have introduced a vulnerability in theory, right? Uh, because some build system validly got something in and then the, the Gazintas and the Gazaltas are, are different. So the build system from GCR would be different from an Azure build, speak one way or another, and that way you could compare it. 
Is the idea of reproducible builds is also done in this case, which is Solar Winds as a specific ISV? There's no open source effort around the thing they distribute. I, are we suggesting that reproducible builds also help that even in a, a private environment, that multiple machines are being validated against each other? Is that what you're suggesting? Yeah, so I can let all that other, um, like Trishank or I don't know if Santiago made it weigh in as well. But I think that, that what I'm thinking of is that even within a private company, you could create, create, say, for example, two different servers that built the software. And if they could verify that those two servers built the same software, you, you know, that would be better than just one server, right? right? So I if one that. of the build servers was uh, hacked and they were able to inject something into that build server that in theory, hopefully other build servers weren't, and then you would see a delta between the two and you can compare. Exactly. And, you know, you could do something like, you know, different systems, different passwords, all that kind of stuff to try and ensure that they're both not compromised. Um, and again, this just depends on your, um, your threat model and stuff and how much, how many layers of protection. But I think this is definitely, if the build system is the concern, reproducible builds is a really key way to um, protect that step of the supply chain. And then that- Yeah, that's, sorry, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, that, that's perfect description, actually. Um, I don't know how many of you are hodling Bitcoin right now. I hear it's uh, skyrocketing. Uh, but the way they, they, the way they build Bitcoin binaries, they use a deterministic virtual machine that removes all the sources of non-determinism uh, uh, Marina was talking about. Three different developers will independently pull the same source code, assuming that they got the same source code, build it on, on their own virtual machines and they would all check whether they got the same hashes. If they don't, they don't release it. You can actually formalize this using Tuffin and Toto and have a cryptographically verifiable record. It's a shame that they don't do that. You have to take the developer's word for it now. But if they just added, you know, this uh, Tuffin and Toto, the public can actually verify what they did independently. I think there's a, a, a bit of a jump here in an assertion. So we can, through Tuff and Intoto, verify the steps that were taken. Uh, we can't verify if any of the steps in itself was compromised, right? Like even if you have redundant, like uh, if you have reproducible builds, you have three build machines, uh, depending on how those build systems end up getting managed, um, a compromise of one could lead to a compromise of others, depending on how uh, the company is securing those build systems, right? I think this is one where we've kind of talked about, you know, single root versus multiple root. Uh, in cases of like a large enterprise, they may have the resources to correctly isolate them, because uh, it does take a lot of effort to isolate different build systems, isolate different key systems. So I am. I still don't quite see um, where Tuffin and Toto kind of like bridge that gap. Um, it's kind of giving us the same assurances as any other SBOM integration would and in saying these were the steps that were followed. Um, but it doesn't really tell us, you know, if, if a step itself was compromised, um, unless you can go down and verify from the source codes itself, which is certainly possible for interpretive languages like Python and YAML, but I, I'm, I still don't follow as to like, you know, how, um, for something like an ISV, like it would have uh, helped mitigate this this threat model. Well, even so, that's a valid point. But even in the case, so compare that to what we have today, which is nothing. With SolarWinds, for example, you have no no cryptographically, you know, you, there's there's no record where someone can rep repudiate their signature. Right now, it's like I don't know, I don't know who did this, I don't no, know actually, which machine was compromised. Sorry, go they, ahead. That was one of the things that was interesting about this is, and I think it was I have to was the first link or the second link rather, the first link I read that first came out is they, because the content was signed, that's how they knew it went back to the build system. It wasn't hacked in the middle, a man in the middle or whatever you want to call it, a distribution attack. So the, the content was signed. So they did know where it went back, how far it went back and where in the build system that hasn't been uh, determined yet. And that's the part that I'm trying to think, you know, understand here is, you know, there's multiple lines, right? There's the whole supply chain. And to uh, Niaz's point, there's interpreted languages where it carries all the way through and you can kind of see it right to the end. There's other languages as again, what we know about this was .NET, so it was compiled code and whether the source was in the compiled code or not, we don't know yet. But the point is, is that for compiled code and binaries, which is what we think about with most container images, there's a, a trans, transposition that happens so what, what I can see, because there's things we know and there's things we don't know, but we know how build systems run, so we can make some hypotheses around what could have happened. 
So I mentioned, right, the, a package that they reference could have been hacked. And if those packages were signed with Tuff and Toto or anything in that matter, and they were doing checking on that, they could have caught that. If the package uh, JSON file that uh, is pr normally produced in the source code was hacked and said, hey, in addition to all the things that were in the source code, also bring in this other package that through uh, injection can actually uh, load itself. So that's just a pattern that multiple languages support in this in, in .NET supports it uh, from what I know of, but well, I don't know what version of .NET they were using. I'm considering a, a modern version of .NET. So that's another possibility. So in that case, if a comparison is done from what was going in and coming out of the build, um, so if two machines, one was uh, hacked and the other one wasn't, that's certainly a, a, a comparison that can be done on the reproducible builds. Like, hey, these two things produce different things. What, what's up? Let's go check. If all machines were compromised, then it's possible that all machines were producing the same thing, but the thing they produced is different than what they expected. So I, the more I thought about this conversation, the tough and in Toto, and, and it more so, I guess, the, the tough stuff is, uh, or the signing stuff that Santiago had been doing, where it's been working on with the software bill of materials work. Everywhere in the supply chain, up until the point it's got built, is the part that is seems to be the vulnerable place here. Um, and that would be a great place to be able to implement this. The best that we seem to have been able to do in this case is because it did officially come out of the build system and got distributed, the best you can do is identify that, hey, it did come from the build system and we don't need to look elsewhere. We know that the builds, that these were valid signatures, valid keys, and um, now we got to figure out how the build system got hacked. And hopefully they catch it earlier than from March till December and it's caught through another multi-line defensive attack where something's monitoring the code and it, it sees the network traffic has changed, alarms go off, somebody investigates and then they, they caught it. I don't, does yeah. anybody know how they caught this by chance? I don't actually know. I think that um, part of the idea of something like Intoto or another SBOM mechanism is that you if you have people looking at these um, supply chain, you know, attestations or whatever you want to call them, they, um, like the more eyes you have, the faster you'll catch it. At the very least, you'll catch it faster. I think at the, it, ideally you would have people checking the process before it goes to customers and the customer is able to check the process. But um, at the very least, this allows um, internally to the company for them to do auditing, you know, hopefully um, pretty often and detect these kinds of things very, very quickly before the attackers have six months to um, get into the system and get the kind of access that they did. Um, yeah. I mean, I think that's that's a very difficult thing to do at scale, right? Um, like if you're going to go in and check every single release in terms of what steps were followed uh, and, and verify whether the steps weren't done correctly, um, it's hard to define a standard layout. Right. Um, we need to give uh, developers flexibility in how they build code uh, and at the same time ensure that there is auditability in place. And so auditability can be done through a variety of different ways. It doesn't necessarily need to be an attestation on the code itself. Um, we have like a lot of different compliance programs, for example, that different companies are part of that go and address similar kind of attestations and saying, you know, what was the process for generating code? Um, were there any sort of like, uh, what's the process and monitoring in place for detecting sort of uh, uh, unauthorized actions? What are sort of like the escalation controls in place? How are those monitored? So. Um, I think a lot of those controls are in place. Um, and, and I think this goes down into like different companies and different developers in terms of what that company or enterprise is willing to take on in attestation and saying that when I'm publishing software, this is the standard I'm willing to meet. And I think through the community, we're gonna see that different companies are gonna have different uh, attestations they're willing to make because there is a cost associated with going and making these as well. So, um, I think the challenge I see uh, in, in sort of like with uh, Tuff and Intoto is that we're making a series of assumptions that if things were set up this way and if all these steps could be verified, then yes, we'd have a great working solution. Um, but I, 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 I still don't think that that's a, that's a general solution that everyone can adopt uh, because of some of these inflexibilities that I think are going to come up as challenges. And I think it's one where 
my take on it right now is Intoto should be an option for anyone that wants to use it. Um, but I, I still see challenges in making it sort of like a default solution that everyone has to use and follow a certain layout. Hello, uh, can you hear me now? Yes, I think we can hear you. Yeah. Okay, hello. Uh, sorry, I've been trying to talk for like uh, eight minutes now. Uh, I think uh, I wanted to make a couple of precisions before uh, we continue talking. First of all is uh, the producible builds right now, like the project, Rebuilder D is using in Toto. So you can verify uh, that you have multiple different instances and all of them agree on the same result. Uh, the other problem here is that, as you said, the build system is compromised, but the build system had a signature over the resulting build and it should have reported what it used to build. This would have given enough, enough, us enough information to know whether it was a compromise on the source code that was uh, introduced into the build system or if it was a vulnerable dependency that was introduced into the build system or was it like they actually had SSH access or whatever type of access into the build system. And the reason we don't know that is because we don't have something like in Toto in place. Uh, that's one thing. The other thing is all of what you just said in the last two minutes is exactly the problem with SBOMs as well. Uh, and the reason why in Toto is made in the way that it's made is because we don't make any assumptions as to why people or what type of information people are going to produce, but rather we're expecting a minimal layer of information to be produced to provide meaningful supply chain verification. Uh, an SBOM right now is a very, very elaborate uh, piece of information that uh, as far as I'm aware, will only be useful as things made it through thrust boundaries, through a vendor, from one vendor to another vendor. In this particular case, the vendor was uh, importing their own code, importing tools, um, setting up their own, uh, infrastructure. So I actually think that making this with S-bombs and S-bombs only will not fly. It's actually less scalable than in Toto. Uh, the other thing is uh, there is a distinction between policy and uh, producers of evidence. And I think that's, uh, that will also answer a lot of questions regarding uh, the feasibility of a solution. If I am a consumer uh, as a government contractor, I can define a policy and I can verify it with a uh, the information that these people are producing. If they're not producing that information, I can just deny uh, this product. And that's exactly the type of uh, semantic that we're trying to enable users to have. Uh, and that's why in total is so minimal. In, in reality, it's just very little attestations with five fields and a, a way to write policies to verify that these attestations are being followed. I don't think you can make the same uh, security uh, reasoning using something like an S-bomb because it's uh, it's similar to X509. It's very, very, very elaborate. And it, that has its own space. But I uh, I don't know if uh, we can claim that a, an S-bomb that has a, like its own topology and it has, the last time I checked it, it, it was shy of 20 something fields with different uh, meanings is more complicated than an Intoto uh, at station that has five. The reference well, I did to SBOM was more of, so again, going with what we know and what we don't know, but we know about build systems. So we know that the build system, we, we know that the build system shipped it. We don't know if different, well, we also know that this thing had been shipping for several months. So if it had been shipping for several months, let's just assume that it was either one build server or multiple build servers that were consistent, just for the sake of a conversation here. Because if, if you're, if you're, if you can hack a particular build server, there's lots of things that could happen, but let's, go with another angle that I think could maybe shed some light on where this could help. If all build systems were um, built in the same thing and it was a valid build and the source code wasn't compromised, then something had to be injected into the build system. And being the user packages, we know all languages use some sort of packages and in this case, it's just yet another one. If they either hacked a particular package that was a valid package that will, a package that they were specifically referencing and they were able to inject code into that package. So now that has taken over or they were able to declare a new package was being added to the build that wasn't declared by the developer but they were able to hack into the package, uh, package JSON file. In those two cases, and then if there's more, let's talk about those also. But in those two cases, the thought was the S bomb. If there was an S bomb for the package that the the re, the package that they actually put into the build, if they did some kind of comparison, that would not match the S bomb that was certified. Now, of course, 
if that package itself was validly built upstream, maybe there's a question there. Um, or if an extra package got added to the build system that was not part of the declaration, that there's a comparison there that could be made. Are those, that those feel like things that I could see one of these, you know, tough and toto kind of scenarios or an SBOM that has enough information to have a, a delta comparison on it be a way to catch that. Is that valid? Well, I think the, the concern I have is, is, is a little bit higher, a little bit different than that. Whether you use an SBOM, whether you use Tough or Intoto, uh, whenever any system is making an assertion, you are trusting that the system is doing the right set of steps. Unless you can go back and validate from before that step and reproduce that result, you really are trusting that system that it did the right thing, right? And which is where I think like the way we look at it, like and if a build system does an injection of a commit, but it gives the signatures of all the other commits that it does the build on, but doesn't add in whatever in code injection it does, unless you're able to go back to that code repository and do the build yourself, I don't see how you detect that a code injection happened um, through any kind of SBOM or tougher in Toto. So that's the gap that I, I think that like, you know, the way we kind of address that, and I, and I think this goes outside of the signing world is that um, for large enterprises, like we are distributing software that's being trusted. We're not necessarily going out and saying trusted because this developer signed off on it. We have audit and compliability, compliance reports that go out and say, here's how we build software. Here's every time someone pushed a code out with our code review. Here's the approval step that went for that. And we have those attestations in place and we have those audit logs in place, uh, which are reviewed by third-party independent services. So signing is not the only way of guaranteeing that, which is what I wanna get away from saying that Intoto is the only way to address this. There's several different ways to do it, which is why I feel this should be optional for companies to decide how they want to make these assertions, not necessarily saying here's a way to do it. And I, I don't agree that Intoto is easy to set up. It is easier than other SBOM solutions, but in terms of like, you know, when you're defining a standard layout saying here's how software needs to be generated, you are removing the flexibility of your developers to go outside of that model for valid reasons which may arise, right? So there is a lot of work that needs to go into uh, producing software at scale that says, hey, like, you know, here's a standard model, here's how we're doing sort of like, uh, if you're doing a rollback, uh, maybe it doesn't have code reviews, but you know, a rollback is to a trusted code. Uh, there may be different audit, audit things that you need to kind of push through. And, and, and I think like having a standard model through in total kind of like does slow that down a little bit. So that's why I think it should be an optional thing saying, hey, here's a mechanism to do it if you want to use it and this fits your need. Um, but I, I, I still don't see that this is a solution that addresses the compromise, at least from what we know so far, one. Uh, and two, I don't think this is something that provides the kind of software SDLC security um, that we need uh, to kind of prevent similar attacks in the future. I am honestly a little lost here. Uh, I haven't seen any single security mechanism that doesn't get in the way of breaking the process. And uh, if what you're saying is, well, we sometimes need to break the process, then I would really like to, to know how will you differentiate between somebody breaking the process because they're good or somebody breaking the process because they're bad? Well, so that's that's kind of where sort of um, how companies construct it goes in, like how they how they construct their compliance reports and things, for example, for ISO and SOC go into place, right? Um, you can have human access monitoring and saying like, you know, if there's a change in code, like, you know, you need this, you need this F2 ticket or some other thing to track that action against, you need an MCM, you need certain approvals and those approvals need to be noted. Um, but there, there are sort of like, I think a variety of ways that different companies address that. I don't think there's a one, one solution that fits all. Right. Which is, so, uh, it's exactly like there is a policy in which somebody can say, if, uh, I need to, uh, short circuit this element of the, of the. DLC, uh, I need to have somebody to actually sign off on it. And if some, something goes wrong, I want to be able to walk back and see the sign off. And that's uh, that's exactly an attestation that you can also encode in Intoto. Uh, that's why it's so minimal. That's why uh, the idea is that you can essentially keep a record of this operation taking place. Uh, I, I don't know if I have a software version 1.0 producing uh, produced in like the blessed way, but then I have 1.1, which is a Hot fakes that needed to have some sort of a bypass on uh, security audit. I want to still keep a record of this bypass. 
Uh, I totally exactly. agree with if that. I, if I may, um, sorry, uh, could, I, could I make a point? Go ahead. Thanks. Um, I, I see both points of view here, which is that, I mean, yes, Niaz is right in, in the sense that, so I, I think this, uh, there might be a misunderstanding here, which is that Intodo doesn't tell you what to do, right? It's, it's actually like a plastic mold, that clay thing that you play with. You have to tell it what your, what your layout looks like, right? It's not the same for everybody. And I agree that finalizing that layout in the real world can be very complicated and messy, right? Because you could have many, many build steps with rules that change all the time. And I've run into practice with this myself at Datadog, right? And, and I had to update the rules for my pipeline without breaking backwards compatibility for end users. And I don't want to get into the boring technical details here, but there's a way to do it. It can be done. So I agree with you that these are valid real world concerns and you wouldn't start using Indoto to start instrumenting every single little step in your pipeline right away. That's not how it's going to work. You can slowly iterate it and make it more complicated as you formalize all the rules. So I think there's definitely ways to go about the problem and no one's forcing you to do anything to follow you know, any particular rules, but it should definitely be a, a, an option for, for people who want the kind of security to, to, to prevent the next elements because I honestly don't know of any of this technology that would do it. Um, I think that that's kind of like the last part is where I'd push back is there are ways of doing it today. Um, Intoto is not necessarily the only way of doing it. Um, I think Intoto is, is, is one of the ways of doing it and it definitely has a lot of pros and cons. So I'm not saying that uh, I object to uh, Intoto being an optional use case. Um, the point here is that um, I know that at least for like a lot of the, for the large cloud enterprises, right? As an example, for AWS, for Microsoft, for Google, uh, we have ISO and SOC compliances where we're providing this exact same kind of data that says like you know our code was pushed through uh, following these regulations, and we have audit logs that we maintain for that. Um, I do recognize that that's not something that every company can do. There is an associated cost with generating this reports with having the monitoring in place. Uh, Intoto can definitely provide similar uh, kind of uh, attestations, which is why we've been interested in the Intoto project as well. The thing that I want to call out here is like when you when you talk about like a layout file going out, like right, this layout file then becomes another code artifact, which then becomes sort of like you know. Uh, susceptible to sort of like a similar model of compromise because at this point you're saying that well we're trusting uh, whoever's generating the layout file has generated a valid file and at this point like you know if, if an attacker were able to kind of go out and generate a layout file that's compromised and signed they can then introduce additional things through there so it's a constant yeah, kind of like things of like defense and depth that we're trying to provide here right yeah, good question. I mean, so actually that's the reason for using tough as the compromise resilient. It's a way to make sure that no one can pull a switcheroo on your on your layout once you finalize it. You can make it effectively immutable, but we can talk about that later. It's a valid concern. You're definitely right. You need to set things up properly, but there's a way to, that's the reason for using tough as a secure transfer protocol here. Yeah, right. I'll add that it's a, that's a very, that's a very interesting point. Uh, with in total, in fact, when you verify a layout, you create an in total attestation of that verification step, uh, which uh, allows you to do a lot of these things. Uh, say uh, you want to have a step within the chain in which you verify uh, a subset of the supply chain and produce an attestation that you can transitively trust to know that somebody else was actually doing uh, a pre-verification of, say, uh, importing artifacts or checking uh, elements within uh, a sub-team of the of your organization and, uh, and situations like this. And I, I think that's uh, that goes right to what you were saying that like this needs to scale and you need to be able to provide a, a cryptographic paper trail of all of the operations in such a way that uh, you know uh, to some, with some degree of assurance that the overarching element is being uh, protected, but also you don't want to uh, worry about the little details about who wrote the policy for the version control system or who wrote the policy uh, for the security audit and so on and so forth. Yeah, something I'm trying to understand though is if we see this as like it's an iterative process, it's gonna take a while to get all those steps done because what I'm looking at is like the Docker model, when you build this base images are gonna update, you're gonna have external stuff you're pulling in, you know, first step in most Docker files are saying apt get install maven or something like that. Um, as you go through all these different things, you're pulling all these externalities. And so it's a lot of effort to go through and get all those pulled in and hardened and controlled. And so I'm trying to understand how you get some of the value because you need those reproducible builds to be able to verify this stuff and I know nothing's changed, you know, 
until you make it all the way through all those steps and get every last piece hardened down, do we have the value coming out of this with tough? That's a, just as we're coming to the last quarter of the hour, and I, I see Marina stop presenting, pre presenting so I'm not sure if there was more there, but or more the relevance as where we're at the conversation. Where I see us at is there's from what from what we know, um, the hack was in the build system and somewhere upstream, and there's a cutoff that it didn't apparently come from the source, but again, it could have come from somewhere else in the build system. Once it was built and shipped they were able to validate that this was valid and it came from the build system. And, and that is the scope of what we've been doing um, in the MV2 work to certify that the thing or not attest uh, the exact words to sign the artifacts in a registry that says this is the was came from the same source or multiple sources attested to it because we support multiple signatures. And that part we seem to have a consistent model for being able to validate that. The what I see really highlighted here is two is things that Brandon was kind of touching is in the build system. There's part of the build system that is just completely inherent to whatever the language that's being used. Uh, included including part of the language is the build system itself, right? Whether it's be an ACR task YAML or a, an AWS, uh, I forget what this the code, the script that's used there to define things in their build system or GCR build and so forth. There is various build systems or Git, Git, GitHub actions, um, but there's also a part of the the Docker files that also say from another image. So the the other place that I could see, in addition to the fact that the registry is shipping something that was put into it and it was the signatures were associated with it is the from statements could also implement uh, a validation that the signatures are also valid. So that if I'm expecting the Debian signature um, that it didn't, wasn't you know, hacked and I'm now getting something that's not signed by Debian. Um, now, if Debian was also hacked, then we have the same problem we have with SolarWinds, but at least you have traceability to know where that came from. Then of course, we're back to the conversation of how fast can you figure out once you were hacked, so you start tracing back. Right, uh, and so I, I think, uh, uh, sorry, I, I just wanted to add that uh, to Brandon's question is uh, security is an ever moving target, right? And uh, the more we can uh, make uh, inform informed decisions about what happened, then we can better plug the holes. Uh, the point that you were bringing, Steve, that I think that's a, that's a, that's a great one. And I think, for example, with uh, Intoto, you can actually use the Intoto transport to fetch the reproducible build data stations from the rebuilders for Debian. And you can say different people have built these Debian packages that I'm about to install, and I can take all of these attestations and move them forward uh, for auditing or save them somewhere. So I can say uh, this individual uh, Docker image that was using Debian packages to build this particular element was built using these packages that have been in independently built by all of these different people. Um, so I know that uh, maybe the compromise didn't come from the packages, it came from somewhere else. I don't know, the Docker file or like some coral curl pipe SH situation or something like this. Um, I think uh, the more information we get, uh, the, the more we're able to understand the supply chain uh, in a trustworthy fashion, the better we are able to say, this is what happened. And I think that's uh, the more like elucidating part of the solar winds attack that we, we're, uh, and all, we're all saying this, we're able to walk back all the way into the, into the build system. And then we're kind of like, we have all of this like, meta information about what happened. We have educated decisions. We can do a lot of forensics about uh, about this uh, and we can come up with a, a couple of working theories, we, but we don't have the the trustworthy information to actually make a definitive decision about what exactly happened. Exactly, just to, just to shortly add to Santiago's point, which is that what's the value of iterating over all the complicated rules? Even if you don't have reproducible builds, you can at least pinpoint exactly where in the build process this, this most likely failed. Instead of doing a long, complicated forensic investigation where you don't really have all the clues. So we said when we sorry, we want to understand what we would do differently in the MD2 work. Um, and what I think is, what I'm hearing is part of it is for the area that we do control or do have influence to, to have a better statement, is that in addition to the, the pull, which in the deployment like Kubernetes and OPA and other stuff that we've been looking at for when an image is deployed, that we can validate a signature is good, is that we should probably explore the various build, container build tools 
um, that also can validate things that are referenced in a from statement or whatever the equivalent in other build container build tooling. Um, that we should incorporate that into it as well. Says, so, all right, at least we know that this thing was signed and there wasn't a mitigation there. But it does sound like there's definitely more work. And I think this is part of what Trishank's original comment was when we posted on this back in December, that this is part of the scenario that uh, the Tuffet and Toto teams have been focused on is the updates. Because it was an update that broke the system. Um, it just so happens the update was considered a valid update from the build system to the distribution. But at least there is work in that supply chain in those multiple lines of defense that there should be some more focus on how this is done. Um, and I think, you know, we continue to have this conversation and it's not meant to be personal, it's meant to be like an analysis of how can we make it easier, is that it, and Nias was touching on this a little bit of, it is hard to implement. I know it might only be five properties, as Santiago says, um, and that might be true, but it, it's, we still have not seen this taken as much up as much as we would like. Uh, I think it's still, I, I know I, uh, we acknowledge it might be my stupidity, but I have not been able to fully digest how I could implement it in a, in a easy way that whether I understand it or all of the developers understand it in the ecosystem. So I'd love to see more of this effort happening. That's why I've been excited around the SBOM work is that there's definitely holes in that. Um, this could have been a compiler. You know, this could very easily be a, uh, there was nothing changed in the um, source code was the statement. There was nothing changed in packages references. Somehow maybe the compiler could inject a bunch of extra code. I mean, it, it's certainly possible. And those are the kind of things that I see the various SBOM efforts kind of uh, focusing on is where did the packages come from? Did the packages come from a place that it also has an, an SBOM and a Tuff and a Toto and all the stuff that Santiago has been working on? And ultimately does the build when it's shipped represent what was intended? And then from that point forward, um, is it considered validly distributed? Um, because what would have been interesting is if the solo wins attack was, hey, it came out of the build system fine, but between where it was built and it was distributed on individual machines, you know, was it compromised? And if that was the case, then, you know, absolutely that wouldn't fall right into the area that we're trying to secure from and we could have learned from that. What I'm hearing here is this is really part of the shift to the left of the supply chain uh, where an exploit was uh, created. Yeah, something yeah. I'd like to see. I, I think we talked a lot about how Tuff might have a good role to play in a lot of this stuff is I'd, I'd like to see how we can implement that. And so it gets into an implementation question of with a lot of the sign work we've been doing, a lot of the stuff you've been doing, Steve, of let's get the signature pushed up to the registry server, how to integrate some of that logic with what Tuff is doing into that model. I don't see that yet. And so I, I think it would be helpful to me to understand how some of that can be integrated in with what Tuff is doing on their side. Yeah, I think we can definitely do some more tangible stuff in that space. I think um, a lot of the, the work that we've done so far is figuring out where um, different types of metadata fit into the, um, the registry model. And I think that um, tough metadata should pretty easily fit into that. So I think that it's definitely, um, if we could figure out um, maybe a, a nice demo for how you can put tough metadata onto a registry, download that, verify that. Um, yeah, and as far as this, this like what we can do for something like solar winds, I think that the most important thing is just to um, support whatever um, earlier supply chain solutions people want to um, to use. And I think that's like the main point about Intoto here is that I think that this is a, a simple open source solution that um, we should at least support so that people who want to use it can, um, you know, can verify down to the source code and through the deployment. And we can, even if we focus mostly on that last step, the deployment, whatever, it'd be nice to include, you know, options to include other, uh, you know, previous attestations or whatever. Yeah, that's, that's fair. And thanks, thanks, Steve, for raising that point, which is that you're absolutely right. We should definitely, and that's partly why we're here, which is that we're trying to also improve the usability for Tuffin and Dodo, right? Especially from a developer's point of view, it's like, I have no idea what's going on. Just tell me what to do. We should at least nudge them towards doing the right thing. So I definitely agree. Um, so if they're like standard layouts, we can provide developers here. Don't think about it. If, it, if your build process looks like this, just use this file and fill in the blanks with the keys and that's it. Uh, definitely agree. And the second thing is that I also agree with Brandon that we, we, I think Marina is very close to, she 
actually might have a working demo too. The, the very least we could do is show how Duffin and Toto could have you know, prevented the solar winds attack, but for containers. Uh, but we need your help in figuring out where to stick all of this metadata on the OCI registry level. That's something that we're not clear yet. So maybe if we show you the demo, you can tell us, oh, okay, I see how this works now. And here's where we can stick in all this metadata. Yeah, I think the, obviously the registry has lots of places to put stuff. That's the point around the, the artifacts approach is that it, it is so flexible. The question that I think we're struggling with is how would that have helped? Um, because you know, we wanna see where is the gap and what do we need to fill that gap and, and, and identify well, something that actually does. Well, I don't, yeah, I'm not sure if that's, well, I mean, I think that's one of the things we're talking about today. And I mean, but there will be potentially, I mean, I think we all agree there'll be potentially some attacks we can't do anything about. But I think the aim is to at least raise the bar, given that the default right now is you can't put it, prevent anything at all. <laughs> um, and but I think you know there there there's definitely issues. I think the the reproducibility versus compromised build host issue is just like there isn't a there isn't a good solution other because the compilation process on a totally compromised machine or where I mean it's it's I mean a lot of the cases of a compromised build machine are going to be equivalent to key compromised for that stage anyway. So. Um, I mean, the things that are important about key compromise are about how you recover and detection and those kinds of, you know, what you do about that, because, um, you know, I think we're going to have to understand that there will be cases where things won't be prevented, but there'll be, there's still, you know, basic, um, a huge number of cases where they will be prevented. So one of the things that I kind of riffed on a little bit in my head of the reproducible builds is you know, we're, we're, it's pulling this other piece. We're seeing registries you know, multiply. There are gonna be multiple public registries. Right? We, we started with Docker Hub and that just brought awesomeness to the community because we knew where to get content and not have to build VMs from scratch or figure out where do we get the base part of the VM. So that's awesome. But now we've got you know GCR and and um, you know just the long list of you know between GitHub and now AWS and and so forth. The same image could actually is going to be able to get from multiple locations. I'll be able to get Debian from six different locations. The thing that was kind of interesting in the reproducible builds. So let me start. The most obvious if the same image is copied to multiple registries then that's fairly easy to validate. It'll be the same digest, it'll have the same signature, all of that will still be valid. So that, that part's good. The interesting one to me about this one was the reproducible builds. And like I said, at Microsoft and I'm sure other places, we rebuild the Kubernetes images. And when all the open source code that we use as images, we are moving to rebuilding all, if not most of it, um, for to make sure we can service our customers. But we've also seen the downside of that is we see the security vendors come back to us and say, hey, we, you're using a different image than what we're getting from GCR. And it actually has the same vulnerabilities in it, but it's a different digest. So that itself is uh, throwing a flag. What would be interesting is if we were able to compare um, two builds of Debian um, from two different environments, like the one that came from Microsoft and the one that comes from GCR, I'm just going to use, for example. Um, I, I said Debian versus Kubernetes, but it doesn't matter. Um, the, even though they're built separately, is there something about the conversations we're having here, whether it's SBOM, whether it's in Toto or Tough or something, is there some introspection that can be looked at? It says, yes, these actually were built separately, but they actually do represent the same content, so we're good. The security scanners will give a thumbs up to both. They have the both have the same set of vulnerabilities that is known and improved versus one of the two and I won't pick which one, but let's say one of those got hacked and its build system got hacked like SolarWinds. And that company's distribution of that same content is considered vulnerable and it's identified, it's not just identified as vulnerable, but it's identified as different. And the fact that it's different uh, throws the flag and now somebody could, a human might start looking into it. Yeah, I mean, there's a bunch of issues with container images from the reproducibility point of view. There's a bunch of stuff around a lot of that in the OCI v2 docs. And I mean, the formats were not designed for 
bit for bit reproducibility. And so there's a bunch of problems there. Most of those, I mean, I think those things are kind of understood at this point, what the problems are, but there's a lot of work to do to actually make um, the actual reproducibility of container images easy. Um, but that's, you know, that's stuff easier. that's important to do as well. So I think uh, just really quickly, one thing I want to throw in here, um, these are all great problems to go solve. Um, are those relevant problems for this working group to look at right now, right? Because the way I look at it, um, validating um, uh, the steps in the supply chain, they're important, but they're op they can be done on top of the initial distribution signature that validation that we're looking at, right? Um, I don't see that the work we're doing here prevents any of this additional verification uh, for anyone that wants to implement it. Um, and without an agreed upon signature format, we have a higher issue in the uh, in, in, in software distribution, which has much larger threat models that we're already aware of, right? Um, so I think the, the, is that something that we should have a separate working group look at as a separate project? Or is that something that needs to be part of like the code signing uh, initial sort of like working group we have here? Because I think there's separate distinct problems. One with the longer term trajectory where we have a lot of other things to understand and how uh, information is stored within the registries themselves. Yeah, I, I definitely agree. I think that there, are um, to a certain extent, there are different problems. I think that the most important thing we can do is make sure that whatever solution we come up with here has a space. Um, it can just be, you know, like a, you know, extra space in the metadata or whatever that can allow um, whatever solutions for the downstream. And yeah, maybe it's a good idea to also have a working group talk more about um, the specific build system steps that we can include in that space. But I think as far as what we're doing here, I think the most important thing is whatever um, metadata formats we come up with as part of the um, OCI spec or whatever, that they can, they have the space for this kind of information. I think that's the, in my opinion, the biggest thing. Uh, Steve, I think you're muted. I yeah, I'm just trying to use the space for it, but I'm not the right focus. Anyway, um, I think we have something we wanted to do, to, to Neil's point, we, we wanted to have something moving forward, because what I'm, and, and with all of these, you're always looking for something to learn. Like I was hoping there'd be something about this that says, hey, what we are doing, we should do this one step better because then we could have, you know, demonstrate how we could mitigate this. So you're always, to me, I'm always looking to learn what we can do better. Fortunately or unfortunately, it sounds like the path that we're having at least gives us the same traceability that SolarWinds has. They knew it went back to the build system because it was signed. Today, images are not signed across registries and even within registries, they're not really signed that well. So we'll at least be able to meet that bar for traceability, which is actually huge. Um, and we've also said that we wanted to, that was a phase one and phase two, like in, once we can understand how better we can use a, a, a tough and in toto kind of implementation that spans across multiple registries, supports moving across registries, supports private registries, all the things that I think were a, a shift on the original scoped work that was done with Notary V1. When Notary V1 was done, there was one registry and the assumption was one. I don't wanna get in too much into everybody's participation at the time, but now that we've had this explosion, this content movement, it's changed. And we haven't figured out how to make it work in that private and public reg multiple registry scope. If there is a way that Tuffet and Toto can be used in that, great. And we could come back and revisit that in the in the phase two portion of it. Yeah, the I mean, work that we're doing in phase one also is flexible enough that it doesn't prohibit, prohibit an additional signature model being put in. It's something I think we've taken extra time. If anything, it's been a little slower because we're making sure that it'll work across all artifacts and has a lot more flexibility. Um, I just so. want to interject really quickly that um, I think we've demonstrated how tough can work in the multi multiple repository multiple registry situation a couple of times. And so um, I get that, you know, this is a process and there are different stages to that and whatever, but I just think that that's, if there are concerns with the way that we've implemented that, I think we, that's a good thing to discuss, but I just know that we've, we've gone over that. 
I think we've discussed that. I mean, the the concerns I have with Tuff, which are unrelated to Intoto, one is that, you know, we're making an assumption that the latest release is the only valid release, right? I think in practice, we've seen yeah. that that's problematic and that's something where uh, being able to distinguish between what is stale code and insecure code, um, that's one of the things that we haven't seen an answer to. Um, and also uh, the other part of that, like, you know, as we want to move from registry to repository, um, how can we do that without having to re-sign the, the registry specific metadata and, and, and have that burden? So if those are two questions that we can get answers to, I think that makes uh, a, a tough solution more scalable for what we've seen uh, container users ask for. Uh, but without those addressing those two, I think it's very difficult uh, to kind of push uh, the way Tough is currently architected as a standard solution. And to throw a third okay, one on fair. that. We can, also, sorry. I just want to throw a quick third one on top of that, which is that um, the disconnected environments are looking for a solution as well. And so we have a lot of requirements in Tough for um, regular timestamps to be re-signed on this stuff. And that kind of uh, doesn't perform well when you have a disconnected environment that can't refresh those timestamps. Yeah, I think, Marina, there was a, a number of problems we've been identifying, and you've been making great progress, and we appreciate all the work you've been doing. Um, the One of the things was the hashing of data that from across all repos in a registry. That's not something we can do as registries. We can't give any kind of access to anything across um, multiple customers, or even multiple teams in the same company. Uh, so that was one of the scoping things. I know there was a performance question, but it was really also around a security access uh, issue. So I think there's a there's been a number of challenges that we haven't figured out how to solve, um, but I also we also seem to keep on starting with this is the solution. How do we apply it to the problem, as opposed to we've identified the problems that we have. Should, um, as we're asking, shall we stop? shall we specifically address like we're trying to address these and discuss these issues next week as we're out of time. Yeah, we are over. But I think that. Um, um, uh, certainly, uh, um, Marina, would you would you like would you perhaps discuss Niaz's issues in particular? Yeah, I think I'd be happy yeah. to. Um, I don't want to hold people over too much over time, but I'd be happy to address those um, either in a separate meeting we put together for that purpose or the next week's meeting here. I mean, yeah, it's probably. Good for next week's meeting. I would have thought, but we could start. We could start it on Slack. But oh yeah, I can do that too. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yes. Yeah, could you maybe put uh, now Slack's back up and maybe <laughs> a quick summary of 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 your issues and maybe if I, uh, a couple of yeah the were the ones that other people had too. Maybe we can kind of start to um, concretely um, make sure everyone understands what the issues on why people think there's a problem and what they what kind of solutions we're looking for for these. Yeah, I think that that's a great call up. Um, I'll either throw it in Slack or uh, start a doc and uh, link it in Slack. Cool. Okay. All right, thanks everyone. Right, well, so next week, thanks to everyone. Uh, start 2021 in a new way. So uh, we'll see everybody next week. And yeah, by all means, uh, Slack uh, intermittently comes up. Uh, let's keep the conversation going there. Thanks, folks. All right. Happy New Year's, everyone. Bye.